Let me start with David McCullough. Everybody in here knows David McCullough. We're in a library, right? Yeah. Okay, David McCullough, 10 years ago, about this time, came to West Michigan and he gave a talk. If you were listening to what David McCullough said 10 years ago, it was a very clear message. It was that he started a book back in the mid-90s and he thought, I think I want to do something similar to what Plutarch did. Parallel lives. Let's do a life of Jefferson and Adams. And he enters this project really worried. Boy, Jefferson's this titanic figure. Adams, mm, not sure that Adams is going to be able to keep up with Jefferson in a biography. But the more reading McCullough does, the more he starts to change his opinion and he sees that it is Jefferson who's going to have a tough time keeping up with Adams. Adams is the titan. Adams is the titan in his character, in his integrity, in his intellectual capacity, in his achievements as a constitution, an American Solon, a constitution maker. So Adam, uh, McCullough comes to the decision that a much more interesting book would be to take this neglected founder, John Adams, and to make the story about him. And you know the result of this uh, wonderful read and we're talking, we've been talking about Adams for the last 10 years ever since. The reviewers who took a look at uh, McCullough's biography said that inevitably a book like this is going to say a lot about Jefferson. But on every major point of comparison, it's really Adams who comes out as the greater figure in McCullough's biography. Now this is high recommendation. Uh, John Adams' public life does make a compelling story. Let's just set the stage here. I'm one of the first speakers in this series. Let's just make sure that we have a common baseline. Look at the firsts and the unique position he was in in a number of ways in the early days of the Republic. He's the lead author of the oldest extant constitution, the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780. He was the lead author of the three gentlemen who wrote it. How many of you knew that? He was a constitution writer, framer. Good. Now, I'm a classroom teacher. You're going to have to forgive me every once in a while. I'm going to put it on you. I might even ask you a question before the day is over. Or you. Don't look too smug. He's the first president who lived in the White House. He's the only president in U.S. history who is challenged by the sitting vice president when he comes up for re-election. He's the first one-term president to his chagrin, and uh, he's the, because he lost to Jefferson in 1800, the so-called Second American Revolution, he's the first commander-in-chief who had to direct a major military operation outside of the United States. We went to war against one of the superpowers of the day, France, a naval war that took place in the Caribbean, and Adams was the first to, uh, to have to engage in that kind of a, a war, the so-called quasi-war. And here's the point I really want to punch tonight. So listen up. Here's the thesis. I think that Adams, if we adapt Plato's term philosopher king, Adams is truly our first philosopher president. Remarkable mind. Towering intellect, even among the giants with whom he lived. If you look at Hamilton and Jefferson and others who must have had IQs through the roof, Adams was certainly a towering intellect with those others. Now, um, I think it's one, one of the tragedies of our public life today is that our school kids don't know the story of Adams. We know the story. Take the monuments, you know, the, the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, and so forth. We know the stories of those presidents. But still, this historiographic revolution that David McCullough started 10 years ago has not percolated down enough into the classroom. And it's truly one of the tragedies of our modern age that we don't know the John Adams story better. Now, I'm going to come back to some of the intellectual achievements of John Adams in just a bit as our philosopher president. But let's first remind ourselves what the pre-David McCullough world was like for Adams. 
and why John Adams has been called our forgotten founding father. If you go to Washington, D.C., the city of great monuments, of course, to presidents, you won't even find a statue of Adams. Go to Statuary Hall, you've got Sam Adams in there. Go also to the area where the son, John Quincy Adams, died. There's the death, you know, there's a, there's a bronze marker in the floor, but not one permanent marker to John Adams. Go to Philadelphia, where John Adams was the clearest, most articulate voice for independence in 1776 when he served in the Second Continental Congress. Not one statue of Adams. You know, you could say, oh, well, you know, maybe he's over there in the National Constitution Center. Remember, that's for the Constitution. Adams was not at the Constitutional Convention of 1787. So Adams is lacking a statue in the city that he helped change. Go to the Naval Academy. One of my ancestors, Admiral Thomas Gleaves, has a uh, statue of him, but you won't find, I mean, who, who thinks of Admiral Gleaves at this point? But you won't find anything of John Adams, even though, I just mentioned that quasi war with France, even though Adams, the, the first ships that were launched to the permanent U.S. Navy were launched in the Adams administration to fight that war. The only statues that you'll find of Adams, this is so curious, go to Rapid City, you know, where you have, you know, you have, of course, all the, the, the big four up there. And, of course, all the other presidents are lined up. Statues, you have a kind of a touristy statue of John Adams. And if you go to Quincy, you know, formerly Braintree, Massachusetts, you'll see a statue. But Brian and I did a little research on that today. You know when that statue in his hometown was made? After the McCullough biography. Oh. Yeah. It's like, you know, something about a prophet in his own hometown. So anyway, Adams has gotten short shrift. And you know what? We know he was a prophetic figure. We know that he had the gift of prophecy. He saw things that the other founders did not. He also saw that he would go for a long time without being recognized. He said to, in a letter to Benjamin Rush, which, by the way, one of the greatest letter exchanges, and this man who wrote so many letters to Abigail and Jefferson, the letters to Benjamin Rush are also remarkable letters. And he said, very frankly, to his friend, Benjamin Rush, <clears throat> quote, mausoleums, statues, monuments will never be erected to me. I wish them not. Panegyrical romances will never be written, nor flattering orations spoken to transmit me to posterity in brilliant colors. No, nor in true colors, all but the last I loathe, close quote. He didn't care if he didn't have a good story about him, but he at least wanted some true reckoning of what he did when he was here on this earth. It's like those cave paintings at Lascaux and Altamira in France. You know, there's so many of those paintings, they have a, a handprint on them. I was here. I want to be remembered for something I did. I'm the artist. Adams wanted to be remembered for something that he did. Now, why was all this neglect, all these decades, for such a titan of a founder? Why? Well, he's in a crowd of Virginians, isn't he? He's preceded by George Washington, remember the indispensable man, who's fundamental to the founding of this country because he sets all the precedents for being the first president of the United States. Poor Adams is the second president of the United States. And then who's he followed by? Jefferson. Jefferson, the same rival who, remember, Je uh, Adams is a Federalist. Jefferson is going to be a Democratic Republican, and he's going to found this whole party apparatus which will elect the so-called Virginia dynasty. So Jefferson is going to serve eight years in office. Then he's going to be followed by Madison, who serves eight years in office. And he's going to be followed by Monroe. 24 years of Virginians. And then the eight years preceding from George Washington, so you have this, what is that, 32 years. 32 years of Adams shoehorned into this Virginia dynasty, in this little space, this one-term president. And so the victors write the history, 
and Adams gets short shrift. And then John Quincy Adams, his son, doesn't have a, a popular presidency. And then one of Jefferson's allies in the new Democratic, reformulated Democratic Party, Jackson, comes along. And then we have the age of Jackson. So you can see how Adams is going to be shoehorned into the smaller and smaller space as the century proceeds. So that's one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that this New Englander is lost amid um, the Virginians and the Democrats. Yet tides do rise. And Adams' reputation started to rise, I think, I think, fully a half century before David McCullough wrote his book. Can't ever see these things purely in isolation. Because in 1953, a man named Russell Kirk, who wrote just up the road here in Macosta, Michigan, wrote a book called The Conservative Mind. And chapter three of The Conservative Mind lionizes, guess who? Our friend, John Adams. And says he's really the model American founder because he had a better, more profound understanding of history and the role of constitutions and the impact of ideas than any of the other founders. So Russell Kirk begins this process of resurrecting back in 1953. Two decades later, a musical comes along. How many of you have seen 1776? Delightful. Only one of you. Only two of you. Oh, come on. Come on, class. How many of you? OK, about a third of you have seen 1776. I went back and, and watched it again the other night. Delightful, delightful musical. And I forgot just how central John Adams is in that musical. It's not Jefferson, not Franklin, not Washington, the other figures. They're, they're practically just cameos compared to John Adams. It's, it's really presented from the point of view of John in these beautiful vignettes where John and Abigail are talking. And they put the, remember the old technique of putting Vaseline around the, the edge of a camera lens? And so it, kind of a funny way, but that's what, that's what cameramen used to do back in the 60s and the 70s. And so you have this sort of gauzy look of 1776 when John and, and Abigail are writing these romantic letters to each other, beautifully rendered in 1776. So Kirk, 1776. I uh, help him uh, come back, but of course, McCullough's masterpiece 10 years ago. That's the piece de resistance. It's, uh, it's really the book that caused a paradigm shift in the way we perceive Adams, and indeed, America's founding fathers. Now, I looked this up this morning. As of this writing, according to Amazon.com, McCullough's Pulitzer Prize winning biography of Adams is the ninth most purchased book on the American Revolution of all the books in that category. It's the 14th most purchased book on all the books that have ever been written about the presidents. The 14th. Take the HBO series John Adams that appeared a few years ago. Guess what? This is what really surprised me. It's the fourth best-selling miniseries on Amazon.com. Fourth. John Adams. So it's cool to be a, a reader or a consumer of Adams' history. The book splash caused more than a ripple. The historian Gordon Wood, I was listening to Diane Rehm yesterday. She had on the great Brown historian, Gordon Wood. And Gordon Wood made the point that he's editing the papers of John Adams for the Library of America series. George Washington only gets one volume in the Library of America series. Thomas Jefferson, eloquent writer that he is, only gets one volume in the Library of America City series. John Adams gets four volumes. Two of them have been completed. Four volumes in the Library of America series. It's as though we finally have woken up to what a great mind this is. And oh, by the way, you know, the US Treasury has come out with a dollar coin, a gold coin, uh, with the uh, stamp of John Adams' profile on it. Uh, I can't resist the double entendre. You know, if you have a coin, that makes Adams part of our currency. <laughs> he is indeed current. So John Adams is finally getting his due. But it was a long time coming and over a rough road. He tortured himself thinking about fame. He was so agitated. He was, he was afraid 
as I said in the quotation earlier, that he would not be recognized. And of course, these letters reveal the extent to which he worried about this and tortured himself about it. Uh, if you look at um, one of his comments, in fact, he said, quote, he said, times alone have destined me to fame, and yet he knows it's going to be problematic in his life. The quest for fame was always a thorn in his side. Uh, as David McCullough put it, as a young man, quote, John Adams was not a man of the world. He enjoyed no social standing. He was an awkward dancer and, a poor, and poor at cards. He never learned to flatter. There was no money in his background, end quote. Everything Adams earned, he earned the old-fashioned way. I mean, it was from the respect in the courtroom, because he was a brilliant lawyer at the bar, to the readership in the newspapers. He became a brilliant writer on a host of issues, to the leadership in Philadelphia. In every area of his achievement, he worked his way to preeminence. He knew that fame can be fickle and fleeting, and for that reason, he feared posterity would not pay him sufficient homage. Moreover, and this is a little bit more now on the dark side, a little bit on the dark side of Adams, he was eaten up with envy when he thought of the other founders. Given his Puritan New England heritage, he knew that envy was one of the seven deadlies, but he seemed helpless before the green-eyed monster even when Adams was the runner-up to George Washington. And, and folks, in 1789, nobody could have beaten Washington. He swept the Electoral College in the first vote. But Adams is the runner-up, and you think, wow, that's quite an achievement. Yet he envied Washington, his success. He said in a letter to, again, another letter to Benjamin Rush, one year after the election, so now he's the sitting vice president, and this is what he says. The history of our revolution will be one continued lie from one end to the other. The essence of the whole will be that Dr. Franklin's electrical rod smote the earth and outsprang General Washington, that Franklin electrified him with his rod, and henceforward these two conducted all the policy, negotiations, legislature, and war of the time. This is a man who's eaten alive with envy. Adams' hunger for fame stands in stark contrast, of course, to a later president. Many of you probably have heard Ronald Reagan, what he liked to say, and he even had, a, for a time, a sign on his desk in the Oval Office, quote, there is no limit to what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. Reagan's insouciance is in such total contrast to the way Adams looked at his life and the credit that he, he, he sought. I think, though, Adams. Now, Adams believed in eternal life, not in the traditional Christian sense. We'll talk about this in just a minute. But he did believe in eternal life. So if Adams is up there looking down on us now, he probably is happy that he's finally gotten his due, his, his just desserts, and has now achieved some fame that he wanted. Americans have been lionizing him since the Second World War. Well, let's uh, now look at how Adams could be his own worst enemy. We've talked a little bit about his uh, envy. Uh, as we know, the seven dead deadlies always eat us up alive from the inside out. But there were other things about Adams that uh, hurt him. You know, he lived to be 90 years old. Anybody who lives into his, to, to that ripe old age is going to experience his share of setbacks. And, and Adams really did have quite a few. He, he fessed up that his own personality was a terrible setback for uh, a lot of what he tried to achieve. This is somewhat ironic considering the fact that he wrote Abigail and cataloged all of her faults. <laughs> but examining the numerous liabilities of his personality, uh, another wonderful biographer of John Adams is John Furling, and he observed, quote, Adams struck many people as vain, irritable, irascible, supercilious, and tactless. Don't you word, love that word, supercilious? It comes from the Latin above brow, it's raising your eyebrows and looking like that, somebody looking down on people, which was, would have been hard for Adams because he was so short, but somehow he got the impression across that he was supercilious. He maintained a stiffly formal and aloof demeanor, what one acquaintance called a habitually ceremonious manner, and Abigail scolded him for his tendency to indulge, I'm quoting Abigail here, 
in intolerable forbidding silence while in the midst of a conversation. Tis impossible for a stranger to be tranquil in your presence. <laughs> he was often scolded by his, his very loving wife. Moreover, he, he nursed a tendency toward brooding pessimism. Again, I said we're going to be a little bit on the dark side here. But uh, he revealed to his diary on the eve of the Second Continental Congress, the Congress that is going to declare our independence, quote, I wander alone and ponder. I mope. I ruminate. We have not been fit for the times. We are deficient in genius. We are deficient in education and in fortune, in everything. I feel unutterable anxiety. This is, he's talking about his colleagues at the Second Continental Congress who create a threshold event in human history and succeed. Adams also had a hot temper. Oh, was it burning, sizzling hot. He managed to keep his outbursts confined to private conversations, but there was widespread conjecture among people, especially didn't like him, that he was emotionally unstable. One of the most egregious outbursts occurred the only known time Adams demeaned the subordinate to the subordinate's face. In the presidential mansion one day, he dressed down an aide, James McHenry. This is a famous incident, and the letter written coming out of this incident was famous. You'll hear some things, I think, that you recognize. He, he, Adams accuses McHenry of scheming behind Adams' back with Hamilton, his rival in the Federalist Party and undermining Adams' influence going into the re-election campaign of 1800. Then came this volley of insults directed toward Hamilton, and he frothed that Hamilton, this foreigner, and I'm quoting Adams, was the most, this is X-rated, are there any children present, was the most uh, restless, impatient, artful, indefatigable, an unprincipled intriguer in the United States, if not the world. The bastard brat of a Scottish peddler had a superabundance of secretions which he could not find whores enough to draw off. <laughs> Finally, Adams decried the profligacy of his life, his fornications, his adulteries, and his incests. Now, I'm going to end the quote there. Such a surprising outburst uh, this was that McHenry ends up writing an account of what happened. And one of the accounts uh, goes to Hamilton, another account goes to some other leading founders, but then one goes to his nephew and he says that he ventured that the second president of the United States was, quote, actually insane. That's the quotation that many of us have heard in the literature. And that's where it comes from, from that singular outburst, that moment with a subordinate. Adams, by the way, felt terrible that he had dressed down a subordinate that way, and he knew that um, he had done wrong. But the damage had been done, as uh, bad temper often does. Besides uh, a penchant for being his own worst enemy, there, of course, were situations that made Adams uh, fear that his reputation might suffer. How about the one going all, all the way back to the Boston Massacre, 1770, where Adams actually defends the Redcoats? I mean, he had a, his law practice was only about four years old at that time, five years old at that time. He was having trouble getting cases. He was st finally starting to get some traction, and then he goes and defends the most unpopular uh, half dozen men uh, in the world at that time. And uh, he did it out of principle because he said we would be a colony, an empire of law, and not of passion. A second, uh, if you look at his two terms as vice president, I mean, a man with his restlessness and his vigor, his intellectual curiosity and his vanity, frankly, uh, taking a second fiddle to Washington over an eight-year period. Uh, complaining to Abigail, he wrote, quote, My country has in its wisdom contrived for me the most insignificant office that ever the invention of man contrived or his imagination conceived. Uh, and after eight years of biding time like that, a, a lesser man would have certainly been more resentful and maybe said, Game's up. Third, look at the Alien and Sedition Acts and the midnight appointments, of course, at the end of his term, which, of course, could have done great damage to his reputation because it made Adams look thin-skinned and unpresidential. It really did. Not, not a great moment for our second president. But the most bitter 
setback, I think, was losing the White House to Jefferson in the election of 1800. Let me spend just a moment on this. Adams despaired that his reputation might not ever recover. Abigail, too, for how scurrilous that campaign was. It was, it was just uglier than dirt. We think politicking is an ugly business today. We don't have a clue. I mean, we are pikers compared to that generation of 1800 carrying on their campaigns. Um, and of course, the, the culprit of that campaign was a friend of Jefferson and his, outli his uh, um, allies called James Callender. In the pages of the Richmond Examiner, he attacks uh, Adams' character, his character assassination, again and again. And I want to read to you uh, a couple of things. I mean, it, it, the general tone of most of these attacks is that Adams is truly a secret monarchist, that he's a warmonger because of the problems with France, and even a hermaphrodite because, quote, he has neither the force and firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. I think it's probably the only time in U.S. history that a candidate's been called a hermaphrodite. Calendar especially wanted to drive home the impression that Adams was insane with rage, couldn't control that hot temper of his. And he spread the unfounded rumor that Adams once became so enraged he ripped off his wig, threw it on the floor, and stomped on it. The picture, the image. Isn't campaigning about images? That was the image. It gets worse. Calendar, with Jefferson's blessings, accused Adams of importing two mistresses into the White House shortly after Adams was elected. One of the mistresses was from French, uh, uh, France, and the other mistress was from Germany. Now remember, even back then, uh, Pennsylvania was a swing state, an important state in the election of 1800. And uh, there are a lot of Germans, right? Pennsylvania Dutch, which is a, a corruption of Deutsch, Pennsylvania Germans in that, that state. One of the mistresses supposedly uh, didn't please uh, Adams, and so he had, he had uh, supposedly returned, um, he, he retained the French mistress and returned the German mistress back to his native, her native Germany. The Pennsylvania Germans were incensed, not so much by reports of sexual immorality as by the thought that the president would reject a Fräulein while holding fast to a mademoiselle. Because Adams couldn't carry Pennsylvania, he was not reelected, and this further robbed him of respect. Okay, let me come to the last part of the talk. Why was Adams then famous? How did he overcome that personality of his? How did he overcome the situations that we've just described and become the famous man that he is today? I think there were a number of things that laid the groundwork. For one thing, he had the education to understand what fame was in proper perspective. He had a classical education. He was deeply read in the classics. And when I say deeply read, he read the classics in the original Greek and Latin. He was fluent, a fluent reader in those languages. So he can read Tacitus in Latin. He can read Thucydides in Greek. And he's, from memory, quoting these in his letters later, quite an amazing scholar with this photographic memory. So he had the education to understand what the, the classicists have said about fame. And they always warned that fame is a fickle thing, not to put too much energy into the idea of fame. Many, many things have to come together for a person to be famous. So temperamentally, I think he was softened by this great classical education that he received. Uh, another reason I think that he is uh, famous is that he was ambitious and he worked hard. Remember. He went for a period of five years where he did not see Abigail. He, he was working so hard, he sacrificed much of his family time to really help the family of the United States uh, get launched. Uh, he um, also, of course, his, he regarded his work as something that saved him because when he went to Paris, he writes to Abigail again and again about the temptations in Paris. They had all these luxuries and there were great temptations to materialism, uh, sexual immorality, all kinds of things that dogged him potentially. And he had the eyes to see it, and he was tempted. He admitted that to Abigail, but he just kept throwing himself back into work to overcome these temptations. And work for him meant writing. 
So he wrote and wrote and wrote. He was a great student of English language. Uh, quotable. How many of you have heard, facts are stubborn things? That comes right out of the trial uh, of the Boston Massacre Redcoats. Uh, he, uh, had a, he was involved really in three great letter exchanges that historians will continue to mine for years and years. Uh, we've talked about the letter exchanges with Abigail. Um, of course, the famous letter exchanges with Jefferson once Dr. Rush brings the two erstwhile friends who have that falling out after the campaign of 1800. They come back together uh, you know, t a decade later and start this incredible uh, letter exchange that goes to 1826 when both of them die on July 4th, just within a few hours of each other. And then, of course, the third letter exchange that I've alluded to by quoting from it are the, the letters to Benjamin Rush and back. Great, great letters that we can profit from. Gordon Wood is going to have many of those letters in the uh, four volumes. So it will be uh, conveniently located to get the, uh, the best and the juiciest from them. I think also, uh, and, and uh, he, he had this, he had this uh, penchant with words. Let me give you one little line of his. He was so frustrated with the Continental Congress. If you watch the HBO series John Adams or 1776, you can see he was exasperated by uh, the Continental Congress. And he said, quote, in my many years I have come to a conclusion that one man, that one useless man is a shame, two is a law firm, and three or more is a Congress. <laughs> I know there's a legislator in the room, and no insult is intended by that. <laughs> okay, so in addition to his education, his ambition and hard work, his being a superb writer who's very quotable, he also, I think, became famous because of some of the things he did as a judge of character. Look at what this man did. It was John Adams who said that George Washington should be head of the Continental Congress. It was John Adams who said Thomas Jefferson should write the Declaration of Independence, even though Jefferson, of course, was very taciturn, very quiet, hardly said a word. Jefferson hated public speaking, so how did Adams know, that's my question, how did Adams know that Jefferson would be such a marvelous writer of the Declaration? That's one I'm still trying to, to figure out. And also, of course, Adams, when he was president, appointed the greatest Chief Justice of the Supreme Court ever, John Marshall. Adams was a superb judge of character and is deserving of fame for that reason as well. A fifth reason is that uh, he really was this, this model of virtue, I think, for the generations. In season and out, Adam shows us how to put service before self. Uh, he was capable of, of great sacrifice. Um, we know this, again, to recur to the, the principled stand he took uh, after the Boston Massacre at great risk to his family. He put them in danger by uh, agreeing to, to defend the British soldiers. And of course, he almost obliterated his law practice. So a man of great virtue and character. And the last thing I want to talk about is his vision. Ladies and gentlemen, I think John Adams got the vision of the United States right. He got the idea of America right. And this is where the philosopher king comes in. This is where he contributes something that we don't sufficiently appreciate. You know, with George Washington, we have Valley Forge, we have these images, we have Yorktown, we have a man who's at the head of the Continental Army. With Thomas Jefferson, you have the Declaration of Independence, you have the University of Virginia, the Virginia Statute, Religious Freedom. You have these very famous things. John Adams, John Adams' greatness also lies in this abstract quality of his, his ability to think. And we don't have, yes, we have the 1780 Massachusetts Constitution. Uh, we have his letters, but his achievements are more abstract. They're in the realm of the philosopher president. Let me give you just a couple of ideas, if I may. Um, are, are you up for this? You, you, you want this? Uh, okay, because this is going to be, this is a little bit more intellectual history. But I think it gets to the core of Adams. One of the people who looked at my draft said, Cleves, you should be giving this at the beginning when they're awake. <laughs> So anyway, uh, you, will be, you will be indulging me to let me uh, to talk about this at this time. The first thing that Adams did was he was in the center of the controversy, the via media. He positioned himself. He had the vision to see where the debates were. And if you look at the debates in 1776 
uh, all the way up through 1789 when Washington is elected, you see that, um, well, let's concentrate just on 1775, 76, when he's serving in the Continental Congress. Of course, you have three basic positions. You have the loyalists. You have the firebrand patriots like Sam Adams, John Adams' cousin. But then you have John Dickinson. John Dickinson at the Continental Congress. Hardly anybody appreciates John Dickinson. John Dickinson is the voice from Pennsylvania, and sometimes he's cataloged as being from Delaware. He's the voice at the Continental Congress who says, we have to be careful. How can we take on the superpower of the day? Are you insane, my fellow delegates? We will get stomped underfoot like a scorpion if we try to break loose right now from the mother country. We owe our loyalty to the king until all available remedies have been exhausted. That was John Dickinson's position. John Adams saw the range of positions, and I think he was able to position himself where he was able to reconcile the John Dickinson type position with the Sam Adams hothead, you know, go for the revolution now. And he did it. Not that he was a wallflower at the Continental Congress. He gave fiery speeches. But philosophically, philosophically, he reconciled some traditions that were important to Englishmen at that time. And that's why I think ultimately the Second Continental Congress is a victory for the way John Adams thought. And I know that's kind of abstract, but it's important to understanding his, uh, his, his contribution to us. Then you go, let's go a little bit further in his career in 1780 when he writes that Constitution. And then the other books, he, he wrote several longer pieces on Constitution making and how important it is that Americans get it right. Because you see, we've lost the sense of a republic that John Adams talked about. If I ask my students in class today, what's a republic? The more informs will say, oh, it is a representative democracy. This is, ladies and gentlemen, a very watered down version. That's not what John Adams meant. And that's not what the generation of 1776 or 1787 meant. To them, a republic balanced the three great orders of society. It balanced rule by the one, monarchy, with rule by the few, aristocracy, with rule by the many, democracy. You take any one of those elements by itself alone, and you have a recipe for tyranny. A monarch who's unchecked can become a tyrant. An aristocracy that's unchecked becomes an oligarchy. A democracy that is unchecked becomes a mobocracy. And Adams warned his generation and posterity again and again that democracy would not be the solution for the young republic. We had to be a republic in the way the classics, the way that the, the old English tradition understood that it was a, a balancing of these three orders. Again, ladies and gentlemen, this is very abstract, but it is a key contribution to our understanding of ourselves and who we are as a people. And of course, it comes to life, it's given flesh when we look at the monarchical element in our government, the presidency, the aristocratic element in our federal government, the Supreme Court, and the upper house of Congress, the Senate. And then we look at the democratical element of our Constitution, the House of Representatives. Checking and balancing. Adams understood checks and balances better than any other founder, and he understood that Republican tradition as well as any of the best thinkers among them. And that was the concept of the Republic that was important to him and that he'd want us to know. Don't mess with that or you'll get tyranny. Religion. Religion. Oh. This is a tough one. McCullough, I have to disagree with McCullough here. McCullough calls Adams a Christian. Adams accords great respect to Christ. There is no question. But ladies and gentlemen, Adams is a Unitarian. You can go to Quincy, Massachusetts and walk into this church. It's a Unitarian church. It is not Trinitarian. Christianity, by definition, is a Trinitarian religion where Jesus is part of the Godhead. Adams did not consider Jesus part of the Godhead with the Holy Spirit and God the Father. So the only way I can explain this in classrooms is to say Adams is a Christian in the way uh, Buddhists follow Buddha. No Buddhist 
thinks that Buddha is divine himself, like God, like our conception of God. But a, a, a Buddhist can say, I am Buddhist. Well, Adams has this great admiration for Jesus and so calls himself a Christian, but without considering Christ the part of the divine Godhead. Does that make sense? That's in his private life. We don't think this way anymore. So it's hard for us, but the, the obligation of a historian is to pull the students, the readers, the classroom into a past century, to break out of the province of today that hems us in, to understand that there is a different way of th seeing and arguing things. And that's the best way to see Adam's private religion. In his public role, he was absolutely supportive of religion. He had a dark view of human nature. He thought that humans needed uh, the checks and balances of religion. And he uh, made no compromises with this. And in fact, he said, he said, our constitution was made for a moral and religious people and it is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. That was his view. Um, one of my scholar friends likes to say that Adams was like a flying buttress, supportive of more orthodox Christian churches, but happy to be outside them. <laughs> the last little thing I want to say to you tonight, you've been most patient with all these abstractions at the end, but it's such an important topic. It's about happiness. You know, when you go back and you look at the founders, they ask a question that we rarely ask today. We're concerned with individual happiness. What makes I, me, mine happy? It's about me. Can I be happy? The founders in 1776 and at the convention in 1787 talked about the happiness of a people. What makes a people happy, a nation happy? What policies are necessary? And the answers to those questions are very interesting. Um, Adams would certainly argue with our contemporary view that happiness has to do with power, pleasure, pride in getting our way, profit, none of those things. Happiness has got to be grounded in virtue to Adams and most of the founding generation. Very different view of happiness. Because, think about it, Every one of my students gets this next point. You cannot be happy with a bad conscience. Where does a clear conscience come from? Virtuous living. Adams had the formula. He would say, I'm sure about our current generation, our pursuit of these ephemera. He would say, you are chasing a false happiness. This is not a genuine pursuit of happiness. What you're about is pleasure or power or profit or pride. It's not happiness. You got to call it something else. Adams even defined freedom. I love this definition. He said, freedom is the ability to do what you ought. Notice the moral imperative. As soon as you say the word ought, you have a moral imperative. Freedom is the ability to do as you ought. That's true freedom. And that freedom connected with that virtue is truly what makes for happiness. And the, the vision there is so interesting is that Adams pulls together better than any other founder, I would argue, two great traditions in our thought. And one of them is the civic republican tradition that goes back to the ancients that says, this is what we owe the community. The civic republican tradition looked at our duties. And he pulled that great tradition in with the natural rights tradition that started in the late Middle Ages and said, this is what the community owes to the individual. And this is where our human rights come from. And Adams pulls these two, two together into a system of rights and duties. You cannot separate one from the other. You do at your own peril. A constitutional scholar told me recently that he thinks that the reason we are in so much trouble in this country today is that we have taken the second part of that formula. We've looked at the natural rights tradition. We read the Declaration of Independence and we read the Constitution today to the extent that we read them at all and we say it's about I, me, mine. It's about my right. Don't tread on me. I've got a right to this. And we have forgotten 
the other half of the formula, the civic republicanism that meant so much to the founding generation because it's part of this happiness theme I'm talking about. Our lives acquire so much more meaning if we're not just thinking about ourselves, but we're contributing to something greater than ourselves. And if, if our lives have that meaning of being part of that larger community, we're not going to have the existential crises that, you know, we have in the 20th and 21st century. We're too busy to have existential crises if we're part of a civic Republican tradition and not just looking at the I, me, mine of rights, you know, sort of separated from that other tradition. It's abstract, but it's so important to our national life as a people. I can't think of a better topic going into the 4th of July. Let me finish on this. If you go to the state dining room in the White House, take the White House tour. If you get to the state dining room, and the tour guide will almost always tell you about an inscription over the fireplace, actually that FDR had inscribed into the fireplace, but it was from a letter that John wrote to Abigail on November 2nd, 1800. He said, it's a lovely prayer, I pray heaven to bestow the best of blessings on this house and on all that shall hereafter inhabit it. May none but honest and wise men ever rule under this roof. Well, this is a wonderful benediction to us. And I just have a feeling that so long as we the people keep some of these principles that John Adams fought so hard for and was willing to give his life for, if we keep those close to our hearts and our minds, our country will be just fine. Thank you very much.